Okay, uh, we're almost finished with uh, the spiritual hierarchies in the physical world. There are 10 lectures in here. We're at lecture number nine. Uh, Evolution and the Cosmic Human Body. This was given April 18th, 1909 uh, in the morning. And so what Steiner does here is he, um, I think someone in the audience asked him a question about, we're talking about the physical planets um, and is asking, do the physical planets as we see them now, are, have they come about through these earlier stages of old Saturn, old sun, old moon, or when, when do the actual, what, what, uh, what, or Earth, what of these four stages involves the actual formation of the physical planets? And Steiner says, only the fourth, the Earth phase. It's during the Earth phase that the actual physical planets are formed because this is the age of solids, of solidification. We have moved from uh, warmth or fire to air, uh, uh, that's from Saturn, to air on um, old sun and then liquid on old moon and then the phase of solidification. But what happens is that when each one of these phase, phases restarts after the prolias, demarcating them, they go through a recapitulation of the previous phases. And so... Earth, the Earth phase, when it starts, does indeed go through. The Earth itself, actually, if you think about its evolution, it actually does go through a recapitulation of the of the stages. The warmth phase of Saturn is recapitulated, and the molten version of the Earth, which is all lava, it's just a burning rock during its so-called Hadean epoch, five billion or six billion years ago, it's just a burning rock. So right there, it's recapitulating the fire phase of Saturn. That rock eventually gradually cools and solidifies and then gases start to create a carbon dioxide atmosphere which would correspond to the Jupiter phase or the old sun phase in which gases densify it densifies from warmth to the gases and then um, as meteorites rain down with ice crystals and the ice crystals gradually melt and turn to liquid the ocean is formed on the earth and this of course this is a recapitulation of old moon or old Mars um, and then we get the life phase uh, coming with the Archean epoch that emerges after the Hadean. Then we start to get the first bacterial forms um, emerging out of the depths of the ocean in these thermal vents, these uh, fermenting bacteria that we have today in our guts that digest our food for us. They like the darkness. They don't like the light. They haven't been built to photosynthesize as later generations of bacteria during the Proterozoic do come along about two billion years ago, and they learn to harness uh, sunlight to cleave uh, hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen, and they want the hydrogen and the H2O molecules, and they use the energy of the sunlight to capture it with green chlorophyll, and then the oxygen is let go. And as the oxygen particles are let go, it slowly changes the carbon dioxide sky, which would have been red, like Mars, to an oxygenated one, which now becomes blue as the sunlight pours through it. And so uh, you can see how... Uh, so he, he says in that the actual physical, so this is the Earth recapitulating these pr previous three phases, but now also during the Earth phase, the planets are forming. And he says Saturn is there first, which is a bit difficult to reconcile with the fact that uh, really the Sun should be there first, but the Sun has emerged out of a spinning uh, Laplacian cloud of dirty ice. It's basically what it is, is just a spinning cloud of dirty ice that contains helium, within it and of course lots of hydrogen and uh, oxygen and it's out of this cloud that eventually the sun condenses and forms but if we say that the Saturn phase refers to this sort of swirling cloud of dirty ice we could sort of say that that maybe that would square with what he means by the early version of Saturn during this earth phase the fourth we're only in the fourth phase here uh, the final phase where the planets actually solidify then this the actual sun forms out of this, out of gravitational pressures pulling this together and starts burning the hydrogen and then it forms and then we get the recapitulation of old sun with the actual formation of a sun. And then the earliest of the planets to form is Jupiter. We know this, that it's the first, uh, which would be, uh, Jupiter is the um, also, it's a remnant from the old sun phase. And as this thing keeps spinning, it spins off these planets and Jupiter is the first of them. Uh, so we do have a recapitulation of the old sun phase, the old sun slash Jupiter phase here going on. Then Saturn, the physical body of Saturn forms, and then eventually the physical bodies of Mars and the Earth form. And the physical formation of Mars recapitulates old moon. Uh, and then the actual Earth forms as it's sort of twin. Mars and the Earth are sort of twins 
Um, and as in the myth of the Gemini with Castor and Pollux, one dies, the other lives. Life apparently originated on Mars at about the same time as on the Earth, but it, it didn't work. It died. For some reason, it lost its magnetosphere uh, to protect it from solar radiation, and that seemed to heat it up and dry up the, the oceans and, and the bacteria and so forth. I don't think it got past the phase of, of bacteria. So that's the way this works. So all this uh, can be mapped onto Steiner. Uh, people who turn their noses up at Steiner haven't thought him through carefully the way I have here through these talks. This is a very intelligent, highly, highly intelligent, gifted individual who thinks these things through very carefully. This isn't a slapdash New Age uh, Eckhart Tolle book here or a crappy Deepak Chopra bestseller thrown out to make a couple of bucks. That's not what Steiner is. He's one of the highest individuals that the earth has ever produced. Um, so that happens. And then Steiner for a bit talks about how, now th think about during, go back to the Saturn phase, the, the old Saturn phase, not the earth phase with where everything physicalizes, but the old Saturn phase when there was the Zodiac with the cherubim forming the Zodiac. And he says that the prototypes, the physical body forms out of an egg of warmth. And we have already seen how Leo when it, when it turned to the direction of Leo formed the prototype for the heart. And the, because in the old visions of the, the astrological cosmic man, the signs are connected with parts of the body. And he says, so that uh, Leo forms the heart, cancer forms the exoskeleton of the rib cage uh, that will protect the heart and the lungs. Um, and then uh, the ram, Aries is associated with the brain and the formation of the head, the brain, uh, the twins, Gemini, is associated with the symmetricality of the two halves of the body, which are exact mirror images of each other. That's the Gemini forming the symmetricality of it. Scorpio is linked with the genitals. Taurus is linked with the voice, which is also, by the way, connected with the genitals in a mysterious way that Steiner talks about elsewhere that I've forgotten about, where um, there's a reason why uh, a boy's voice at puberty turns into the voice of a man at the same time that the astral body comes in and sexual desire comes in. The two are connected. And so Taurus is connected uh, with the voice in the old astrological paradigms, diagrams. You can pull up a diagram, just type in uh, astrological man on Google and it'll show the diagram with the signs relating to the organs of the body. And so Steiner is saying that this is the macrocosmic body that forms during this super sensible phase, the spiritual phase of old Saturn. Um, but now one begins to wonder if this is true, if, and I'm sure something like it, uh, as Plato says, either this or something like it must be true. There, there's a truth effect here. It may not be hundred percent true. There's definitely truth in it though. Something has happened on the other side, on the astral plane that, uh, has brought the physical world into being with intentionality. It's not a bunch of random particles smashing into each other as science would have you believe. That's nonsense. We do not get this kind of form and order and organization to the world by billiard balls knocking into each other. That doesn't work. <laughs> Drop that right now. Um, so how does this square with the evolutionary model of the, the, the actual physical body that we inhabit? Now we know has an evolution, as I traced in my poetic epic archive, where I trace the evolution of, of life, which starts with the bacteria, where we left off there in the Archean, with these first bacteria forming. And then in the Proterozoic, uh, they get more complex. You get cyanobacteria, you get all kinds of different bacteria forming colonies, giant things sticking up out of the ocean called stromatolites, which are huge sort of three foot tall skyscrapers of bacteria. Uh, and you get red algae forming uh, carpets along the edges of the seas. And all this life is going on and these cells are cooperating, they clump together and eventually they start forming these in the Proterozoic, they start forming these organisms, Proterozoans, that have little flagelly whip tails that can, and they have nucleated cells and they can skip about it. And they're multicellular, like a Euglena, let's say, or a Medusa. They, these are multicellular creatures. And then they form, and by the time we get to the Cambrian, about 575 million years ago, we get the Cambrian explosion with these little animals that all, with one exception, can be held in, in the palm of the hand. Uh, and the one exception is a three foot monster called uh, Anomalocaris, which is the great T-Rex predator here that just gobbles trilobites like candy. And so we have, uh, but we have the vertebrates forming at the same time as the arthropods, and the two are in a contention all the way down the line, as I've learned from studying these geological epochs. We get the first fish now in the Cabrian, 
And if you look at these fish, Hycoichthys, let's say, or Pacaya gracilens, or uh, Myofungjawa, uh, if you look at these fish, they are tra clearly transformed worms, worms that have become flattened and can swim about this way. They're not round anymore, they're, they're flattened, and they have a primitive spine, a, a notochord going down them, um, and uh, there they go, they're off and running. These, that's us, that's the formation of our physical body as it's forming over time there. Then over time, the, the fish are always preyed upon by these damn arthropods like Anomalocaris. Then later we get brontoscorpions in the Devonian, these large monstrous uh, scorpions that are constantly chasing the fish. Until the fish figure out a major innovation during the Silurian Epoch, and they figure out the jaw. Somehow, because the fish has, a, has an O-shaped mouth, all these different fish, and they get a bit larger and a bit larger, never much larger than anything you could hold in your hand. Um, and they have O-shaped sucker mouths. Um, but at some point, some brilliant fish in the Silurian or getting information from the spiritual beings on the other side, which I think is, is a counterplayer here all along, the invisible counterplayer um, to all of this physicality, is that some clever fish figured out how to change a couple of the gill bones and bring them forward into a lower jaw so that it could go like this, and it's composed of three bones. And uh, now these fish can eat. They can prey on other fish much more efficiently and quickly. And pretty soon they get larger and larger and larger until with the Ordovician, we get this monster called a Dunkleosteus, which is a huge monstrous fish now uh, that is now preying upon the arthropods. So the vertebrates now have the upper hand um, and they're preying. And so we're, that's us. We're getting larger and larger. And now um, we have huge predators that can compete with the arthropods, the brontoscorpions and, and those monsters. And so this battle goes on and on. And then eventually, of course, these fish change into lobe-finned lungfish, which are fish that have transformed the swim bladder into lungs that can come up for air, breathe a bit of air and go down and continue respiring the water through their gills. Um, and their fins start getting longer, their lobe fins, they start flapping more. Uh, and then they start laying their eggs out on the land to keep them away from predators. And then at some point there's a transformation and out of those eggs hatches the first amphibian, Ichthyostega, and also Acanthostega. These are the first amphibians. This has to happen in a quantum jump in one evolutionary leap. Um, you can't have a gradual thing going on. All of a sudden there's an amphibian that can crawl, push against the earth. Its shoulder blades have been rethought. Uh, its hips have been rethought to push against the earth so that it can lift its body up and move. Uh, and that has to happen in one generation. One creature all of a sudden hatches out of the eggs that has this amphibian body now that can live on land and in water, back and forth. That's us moving along, developing our physical body over time. And then, of course, these amphibians slowly develop, as we know, into reptiles that eventually get larger and larger in the Permian uh, epoch about 200 million years ago. These creatures get larger and larger and they start becoming uh, dinosaurish, dinosaur-like. But in that very epoch, we start getting the first reptile-like mammals, or I suppose uh, mammal-like reptiles, Thrinaxodon, which is a creature that comes out only at night while the other reptiles are sleeping, uh, which comes out only at night, burrows holes in the ground, you know, like a lot of mammals do today, gophers and, and uh, groundhogs and such, uh, burrow into the ground and they start, uh, they, they have fur now, and they have figured out how to give birth to live young and skip the eggs. Although it must be said that the first to do this at the end of the Devonian epoch were actually a type of fish called Mater Pisces, who give, is the first to figure out how to give live birth to another copy of herself, another fish, as though she were cloning herself rather than laying eggs. So fish actually figured out live birth first, uh, believe that or not. Uh, but then the mammals pick it up and they say, hey, this is a great strategy. We're going to rip this off from the fish and we're going to do this. Now, another transformation has, has to happen uh, when in the transformation from reptiles to mammals, something happens with the relationship to the jaw, once again, to uh, the ear bone. We have one jaw bone and three tiny little ear bones, whereas reptiles actually have a three piece jaw bone and one ear bone. Uh, but mammals have the exact opposite. They, they switch out those, um, they switch it out to one single 
uh, one from one ear bone to three ear bones and one jaw bone instead of a three piece jaw bone. That's pretty clever. Uh, I, I don't know exactly. Someone would have to, some Leonardo would have to sit down and design that on a draft board and say, here's, here's what we're going to do. So there's, an, and once again, you can always infer the presence of spiritual beings who are involved in this process. The guides, uh, as mediums call them, and as Steiner also calls them, shepherding this process along as we incarnate into these bodies. Um, and then the process goes along until we get these mammals who now can give live birth to their young. And it starts the emotional limbic brain forming on top of the reptilian brain, which is cold blooded, of course. Uh, and the mammalian brain comes in with the relation of these uh, mammals to their young nurturing their young, the bond between mother and young, whereas reptiles simply lay eggs and take off. Um, so there's no emotionality there, but emotionality begins with the limbic system and the mammalian brain and the mother's relationship to her offspring. <coughs> so then we begin to get this emotional mammal type creature that evolves over time and eventually turns into the first monkeys during the uh, a later epoch called the Eocene after the dinosaurs are gone uh, 65 million years ago. Then we get the, Oli the Eocene and the Oligocene, and I believe this is during the Oligocene, actually, when the first monkey appears. It's a creature named Gaudenosha, uh, which is a little monkey that's chattering away in the trees at the same time that Ambulocetus, the ancestor of the whales, is uh, a mammal that has taken to, that walks on four legs and has taken to living in uh, shallow areas, like, just like a crocodile does, and waits for prey and then leaps up out of it and eventually gets rid of the legs in kind of weird reverse evolution and trades them back for fins again. Uh, creatures are smart. <laughs> uh, Rand, Darwin, the Darwinian view, just push it out the door. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't account for all this intelligence and intentionality and clear foresight and the incarnation of actual ideas into physical forms. This is what has gone on, not the ridiculous random model of Darwin. Uh, forget that. Uh, so this is the the evolution that has taken place. And then, of course, then we get our monkey bodies, which then develop over time. And eventually, we're walking upright as Australopithecines uh, five million years ago. And then pretty soon, we're in caves uh, fighting each other and liquidating the Neanderthals and so forth. So that's the body as it is built up over time. And now the question becomes, would Steiner accept this model? And I'm pretty sure that he would and does. He accepts the fact that the physical body we inhabit did evolve bit by bit from bacteria to uh, apes. Um, that is exactly what happened. But on the other side, nonetheless, um, these things were prepared long in advance by spiritual forces that created outlines of what the human being would be and how the beings over there could think clear, intelligent thoughts, until, which we could not do until the neocortex was added. Uh, and when the neocortex was added, then we could channel thoughts. And it's a little bit like, you know, you make a conductor to conduct electricity, but it doesn't invent electricity. Electricity has already been there. You just create the conductor to channel it. Same thing with the brain. Human beings have already been on the other side, thinking intelligent thoughts during this evolutionary process, long before a neocortex has come along to channel it, as I'm doing right now, into words through my mouth, to channel thoughts through my words. That's a spiritual process. And I think that uh, Steiner's whole point is that uh, the other side has evolved also. There has, in tandem with the physical world, the other side has also gone through an evolution through Saturn, old Saturn, old sun, old moon as well. Um, and then he gets into this part in this last part of the chapter about what happens on the other side after death. And he's talking about how, once again, with the, the perfection of the physical body, um, let's say you, so you die and you go into what he calls Kama Loka, you cross to the other side, and what happens is that the etheric body that you have inhabited disintegrates after about three days. Um, and then the astral body as well. Um, but he says that, let's starting with the astral body, where if it hasn't been perfected yet, uh, remnants of it get left over there on the other side when you reincarnate again. So uh, the goal is to eventually uh, achieve a perfection of the astral body and a perfection of the etheric body so that they're not left behind on the other side when you reincarnate. And that can only be done through the eyes, the, the, the process of the ego, the eye uh, doing work on the astral body to perfect it into the manas or the spirit self. Um, once that happens, that perfection of the astral body through doing work here, 
um, happens, then you have the astral body, which you can um, you can create new astral bodies and or take it with you back into another incarnation. Um, and then so eventually the etheric body receives the imprint of this perfected manas, this perfected astral body. And eventually you do work, the eye does work on the etheric body, which is deeper and harder to get to. Uh, and it's a lot of ingrained habits come from the etheric body that have to be undone through undoing ha bad habits, such as alcoholism and drug abuse and things like that. So that you print, imprint on the etheric body new forms of cognition and perception, which eventually create the life spirit or the body, which is the transformed etheric body. So that when you go to the other side and come back, you the etheric body does not disintegrate. You can bring it back with you. And uh, he says, this is the creation of a being called, uh, with a body called a Nirmanakaya, which is a, a body that has been constructed and perfected. And so the process is to get the human being to develop these faculties. And eventually the eye does work on the physical body in order to produce the spirit body. And you have a perfected being. When these perfected beings incarnate, uh, we get people like Sri Aurobindo, or Rudolf Steiner himself, or Ter de Chardin, uh, or a Jean Gebser. We get the highest uh, beings that our species can produce, which is not um, an Einstein, let's say. An Einstein is a mere intellectual. Uh, this is a person who has mastered the intellect, but not the spiritual world. Uh, for that, you need one of these great spiritual leaders, such as Arthustra, uh, let's say, or the being uh, Tote, who, uh, who was one of the great spiritual masters, or Manu, who initiated the first post-Atlantean epoch, the Hindu epoch, whereas Arthustra initiates the second post Atlantean epoch, the Persian epoch, whereas Hermes Tote uh, was some obscure individual who initiated the third Egyptian post Atlantean epoch, uh, and then so on down to the Greco Latin and Mar epoch and so forth. So these are perfected individuals, and through the law of spiritual economy, when a, perf when a body, when an astral body or an etheric body has been perfected, they can be transferred. They're saved, and they can be transferred and inherited by other beings who then become like I was saying before in a previous lecture, uh, sort of endosymbionts with these other astral bodies and other etheric bodies that have been incorporated into them to create a much more highly spiritually evolved individual who is capable, as Steiner says, of giving and creating, not just taking from the world. Giving to the world is something that has to be learned and it's not easy to do because I'm sure every one of us knows these individuals who surface in your life who, who are just takers and all they do is take. They take from you, uh, they, they take from other people and they don't understand the concept of giving. Uh, giving is when you, giving is much more highly spiritually advanced than merely taking. And these are individuals uh, who can sacrifice their own personal happiness in order to give to others. That's a higher spiritual frequency and vibration. Uh, and forgiveness is involved in this, compassion. These are the higher faculties that more perfected beings can attune to. Um, these are the higher beings. And by the way, yes, we will be going through Sri Aurobindo's Shri Life Divine, chapter by chapter, and Ter Disha Dan's Phenomenon of Man, uh, chapter by chapter, as well as Alfred North Whitehead's uh, Process in Reality. I'm, I'm going to go through all of those chapter by chapter soon, as well as also Arthur Young's book, The Reflexive Universe. These are the high minds. These are the guys I like now. Uh, the high minds who are able to combine intellect with spirituality. And I think Steiner is absolutely one of the best at the top of, of the human species. Um, each civilization produces their great geniuses who are at the top, um, who are have more perfectly developed astral and etheric bodies. And so that's the upshot of this chapter. So there's one more to go. The next chapter will be on the Christ.